Well, greetings, friends. It's good to have you with us again on our Monday night open forum. And we just invite you to sit back and uh, join us in the discussion that we are about to have, the word open forum. The open part is you, is you, and we'd like to hear from you. And indeed we do. Many of the things we discuss here, most all of the things we discuss, is because someone has asked a question, either by email, telephone call, or uh, personal, uh, personal conversation. Uh, and then we try to bring that on to the open forum. Uh, this open forum and all of these sessions that we have here are being brought to you today through the facilities of the Midwest Center for Truth, located here just out of Leslie, Arkansas, up in the northwest part of the Ozark Mountains. Uh, these sessions are a ministry of CMI uh, Bible Research Center, uh, which is located here on campus, and all of these sessions are a production of CMI Audio Video Network System. And it's being brought to you now through Ustream, Ustream and also YouTube. So, we welcome you who are with us wherever we may be finding you throughout the body of Christ and around the world. Um, We've been discussing uh, in some of our other sessions and are talking with different ones a term in the Scripture that really is applicable in its, in its fullness, in its completeness uh, to Christ Himself. And that, that term is uh, the end, E-N-D, the end. And we're looking at, at this term from the standpoint that in all of its connotations, it still points directly to and is fulfilled completely only in the person of Christ. I believe that He indeed to the Father and must become to us the end of all things. Now, whether we're looking at the things of the old creation, the first, first man, Adam, the Adamic creation, that creation that represents uh, Israel uh, under what we call under the old covenant Israel, uh, the old heaven, the old earth, uh, several of the prophets mentioning Isaiah, the new heaven and the new earth. And of course, in the, in the New Testament, the new heavens and the new earth are only a reality, are only a reality because Christ is himself the end of the old, and he is also the end of the new. He is the bringing to, bringing, bringing to a destruction, bringing to a, a nothingness, uh, the end. Uh, we'll talk about that definition in a moment, the end of the first. Uh, I come to take away the first. Uh, he is the end of the second in that he is, he is the consummation of the second. I had a real close friend 
uh, or a pastor in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, that I had known for more years than, uh, than I will say. Precious brother. But he was always having a problem with the word consummation or end. And we'd sit in his living room and we'd be talking. We'd be talking about the finished work of God in Christ, but actually the finished work of God, which is Christ. Uh, Christ himself being that, that true work of God. Uh, and we'd be talking about that, and, and I, can, I can still see him. He'd turn in his chair. He was sitting like Raven an hour in his living room, and he'd turn in his chair, and he'd say, But, J.W., don't you believe that there's got to be a consummation to this thing? Well, we had, we had already gone through several things that had been taught and had agreed that that wasn't it. Uh, the end toward which God is always uh, working in our heart and in our soul uh, wasn't found in these things that had been set forth as the end. But he'd say, don't you believe there's got to be a consummation to this thing? And my answer every time, I would turn to him and say, and call him by his name and say, there is a consummation to this. It has already come. The consummation is Christ himself. And so that's what we're talking about. But I want to read a definition here because I've looked at this word, the end, uh, for instance, in Genesis 6.13 is where it all starts, and we won't be talking probably about this, maybe we will, but uh, God said to Noah, and you know who Noah is representative of there. He is representative of, of Christ, even as being the eighth, called in the New Testament, the eighth man. The eighth man. In other words, the whole of the family of Noah in the ark was summed up in the sight of God in the person of Noah. Uh, but this whole story is a story of grace, God's grace. Uh, even the destruction and not just the saving uh, but the whole story is the story of grace. Uh, and God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. And uh, immediately upon looking at this, I spent two or three days with it, in fact, because... I saw there Christ appearing before the Father after the cross, and he appeared there in the presence of God for us. And that has this twofold connotation to it. In fact, it in fact it gathers up just about, it gathers up all four <coughs> definitions of this word end. And I'll read the definitions to you in a moment. And I have never in my, in my life, I have never realized my security in Christ as I did in the realization of this scripture being fulfilled we, we read it in Hebrews. He hath, 
that he appears in the presence of God for us. And he does. But he appears there as the absolute end of all flesh. Paul says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. That's because of him saying in another place, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And just to cut this short, my part of it right here, I, I begin to realize that he appears there as the end of the first and as the absolute end, summing up, perfectness, consummation of the second, the new creation of God in the person of Christ. And it just, how else are we accepted in the beloved if we have a life of our own there's no way we can be. We are accepted in the Beloved because He stands in the presence of God as the absolute end of that which God hates, of that which God put out from Himself and put, as it were, and put upon His Son. And the Son became in his death and burial and resurrection, as far as that, the judgment of that first. It is not found in him. And I saw that in just, just this part of the verse. When God was speaking, he was speaking of his son. Because Noah is that whole story. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Christ himself is the grace of God. The end of all flesh is Christ. But the end of all spirituality, the end of all that is acceptable unto God, the end of righteousness, the end of holiness, the end of our faith, the, the, the end of God's purpose and plan and desire. Christ is that also. And I particularly see that when I read in the book of Revelation because the introduction there that is made to John with regard to Christ is Christ himself declaring to John. And remember, this is in the Spirit. This is a revelation of Christ given to John. And in this study particularly, it hit me that he identifies himself as the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. And he does that several times, identifies himself as the one who is, who was, and whoever is, is the better translation, who is ever appearing ever is. And again, he identifies himself, I am he that liveth, was dead, behold, I am alive forevermore. And then in the very last chapter, he says that again, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, I said all of that to just kind of cut to the chase, but what we're looking at <clears throat> is not the end of something, 
he is the end of all things, and we could bring a lot of things into that, and no doubt that's what the Spirit of God does, enabling us to grow up into Christ, who is the head. I almost want to substitute for that, to me, the head, grow up into Christ, who is the completement, who is the absoluteness, who is the perfectness, who is the end to grow up into Christ, who is the head in all things. But what I wanted us to see, or what I'm seeing, is the term the end itself. He is in the sight of God, in the heart and mind of God, in the economy of God. He is the end. Nothing goes beyond Him. There's nothing beyond Christ. He is the end of all things. And in being the end of all things made new, He is the end of all things old as well. So that's kind of what we're talking about looking not so much focusing upon words, which we will do here in a minute, no doubt, but the thing in object is not something he brings to an end or even something that he brings to a completion. Because, Raven, we've talked for years. We've written books on it. We've all preached sermons on it without actually bringing it to its end, the eternal plan and purpose of God. Mm-hmm. I have, my God, you know, trying to, 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 to convince people that God has an eternal plan and purpose, uh, His will before the foundation of the world, and because of that we were chosen in Christ, and all of the things but there is an end to that, and that end is Christ Himself. It's, it, I think it's, it has a lot to do with what Paul says a lot of the times in his letters. And one of the things in Colossians, where and what you were what you were referring to a while ago, is such a beautiful thing when you see. I mean, how, as you said, it's such a securing uh, picture when you realize that in the one who stands before him, the end of all flesh has come and seen, meaning his relation is no longer within that sphere. He doesn't relate there in, in, in that way anymore. Because even in Hebrews, the one who stands in the presence of God for us is is the is preliminary statement, but right, right between that and and the uh, last part of chapter nine yeah. is he come away. He came to put away sin once and for all. Came at the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Because now, having done that, he stands there as a salvation that God observes, the one upon whom his gaze is forever fixed, and no sin is there. No flesh is there. Only perfection, only God's eternal will embodied and realized. And But to me also you have the, the things that Paul, almost like warnings where he says, this is so if you hold the profession of faith unto the end. Yeah. Because you can have a profession of faith, a belief or a, hear the gospel, hear the truth, but never hold it unto the end. It's like Jesus says, you search the scripture, uh, what does he say uh, in John 8, he that uh, continues in my word. Yeah. Well, that word isn't just study a lot. It means continue gazing there until the end of those things appear, until the intent of that appears. And that's what he's saying. Because, as you said, we can believe in a finished work, believe in all of these things, and have these as 
concepts and religious constructs that we would go to our grave debating oh, yeah. and still never see the end of these things and experience him as the end of all of that or as the when we say end the goal of it the yeah the go- the-, the object that was always aimed for now not perpetually aimed at but now performed yeah. and and he's that and, and 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 the term there in the verse we're talking about is in the presence of God for us mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, exactly. the end of all flesh for us mm-hmm. thank god <laughs> the righteousness of god for us so 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 what then so uh, and what does that secure it secures the fact that to those who look for him he appears as a salvation without sin it goes on that you know it's the first thought that i've ever had i mean i look that 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 put all three of those together yeah appearing in the presence of god hath appeared once in the end mm-hmm. of the world we'll i'll we'll maybe come to that in a minute but and then to those that look for him, right. he appears without, without sin under salvation. Yeah. And it, it, you know, those are, those are hand in glove, all, all of those things uh, uh, are brought together, all of those verses are, are brought together in, in this reality uh, who now stands, uh, you know, he hasn't entered into some type and shadow of heaven, right. but into heaven itself, and now stands in the presence of God for us. My word, how much better than me believing I'm standing there. <laughs> yeah, because uh, there's nothing sure there. Hollering, Jesus, 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 or yeah. whatever. And when you see that, there is an absolute now that anchors everything. And... Uh, that's the ground now that you stand upon of surety and, and something that's finally settled where when I'm in view and I'm the picture or, or the object of the thing, there's nothing ever settled. No, there It's isn't. always up and down and questionable. Nothing's ever settled because nothing's ever brought to its end. Exactly. And that's the thing. It, it never is. And it goes back in Colossians 1 where he says, I say these things. So we, we, we uh, what is he, uh, reprove and teach and all of this that you may come, we may present every man perfect in Christ, is how he says it. Yeah. But in the complete Jewish Bible, in the literal version, he would say that we may present every man having come to the goal or the end or that which is perfect. It's all the same word. Yeah. And that's the declaration of it. It's It's declaring to the soul that is indwelt by the end himself that that soul has come to the end by reason of the end now dwelling in the soul uh now where are you going to look to experience the end where will you look to find the culminating consummating thing of all that god ever desired and intended is christ in you so there's the direction that, that the gospel points the heart Amen. to experience him as the end. <clears throat> and you'll hear us say, uh, uh, concerning the working of God in us, and often I'll say God is always working toward his end. Well, I don't mean that he's always working to try to establish his end or to try to have an end. He is always working in us to show us the end that is come, the end he has established. And that's what Rabin just said, uh, that, that, that we might present every man, uh, that, you know, that, that end, that goal. Uh, so, so the Spirit of God is always working in us. I think about what... Uh, what God told Moses to relate to Israel as they were beginning their journey. Uh, I say beginning, the, the journey began, I suppose, when they walked through the door, uh, the blood door. But they were, they were there at, at the, in, in, that same, in that same thing, virtually on that same feast day of Passover, 
and they were told, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, that salvation was, an, was settled in the heart and mind of God, but it, it was an ongoing picture with Israel. An ongoing, an ongoing picture. He had, they had seen the Lamb of God, you understand, and the blood. They had seen the baptism. They, they go on, and finally then, uh, you know, in, in, in the tabernacle of Moses, they saw the high priest, and then on later they saw the king and the temple. My point is, he was always unfolding to them his salvation. The same salvation that, that God was focused on from, the, from his start, from his dealing with them. But he always dealt with them. Maybe I could say it better. He always dealt with them according to his view of the end. And so the Father is always working in us toward his end. By that I mean to bring into our heart his same view of the end. And he does that in the revealing of his son. And what a joy it is to the soul that sees Christ as that end. The end of all flesh and the end of all righteousness. Uh, hun. To me, that's an eternal knowing. That's that it, because it is the truth, then it is eternally the truth, and I think will eternally will eternally be formed and and will find itself being formed uh, in my in in my soul. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think that when I die in this body, everything quits. I think knowing Christ continues because he dwells in our very soul. But it is true that in the scripture as we read his dealings with Israel, he is always working to bring Israel to his end, to the recognition of his end. Mm -hmm. When Christ came, his end came, yep. and his work was still. He came to his own, was to bring Israel, to show Israel the salvation of the Lord. Paul, uh, when he mentioned, uh, no, it's Peter, who says to the concerning, he says, even the end of our faith, the salvation of our soul. Uh, that's not talking about just being born again. Right. The end of our faith the end of our faith, who is, the end who is, the end of our faith. He is the author and the finisher of it, right. the beginning and the ending of it, the end of our faith, even the salvation of our soul. I see nothing other than Christ there. No, I mean, it basically encompasses the whole thing in one person, in one man, the whole journey of Faith, the whole journey of knowing is confined in one yes. person. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's just a, and here's a verse that, you know, we don't think about at, a lot, but to me, it says the same thing that you're, you're addressing. It's in first Corinthians, uh, chapter one, verse seven, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end. Yeah. And what he's doing is showing the confirming unto the end is in the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the appearing of the end himself, there is true confirming, true confirmation. And you, you see then, I, I wrote above it, this the same as Colossians 3. Uh, when the life, when he appears, when the end himself appears, you see what is. You see the end that has been present from the moment of new birth. Yes, that's it. You see him who is the end of it because he is the culminating object, the embodiment of it. Uh, 
And you see that it's been that way ever since he came to dwell in the soul. It's not God taking you to something. It's showing you where he's brought you. Yes. And that's the... That's what we get so messed up on and confused when we read this word, the end, or this phrase. Uh, but as you said, if we, if we understand it's embodied in one person, then it's not some journey to some unknown thing. It is a journey within the person of the end himself. If we fail to see him, and it's this way in everything, but if we fail to see him as the end, then we'll have ourselves mm -hmm. as that object. Oh, sure. And then we're in big trouble mm -hmm. because then we're, we will set about to be, to be what God wants us to be or to have the salvation God wants us to have. Right. Uh, or we'll set about... Uh, and I mean, we'll be focused upon that, uh, not doing, uh, not doing that which is not Christ, being Christ-like. And I thought about that here a while back, looking at this and 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 some others uh, uh, realities, and and uh, and it come to me: since when is God after Christ likeness? He's after Christ. But we, we will make ourselves, what I'm trying to say, folks, we'll make ourselves the object. Well, we're not the object. We're not the end. And we'll never come. We'll never be satisfied. We'll never, we'll never be secure in our, in our salvation. I was with a precious woman at her deathbed. And uh, I've been there several times, but with this particular woman. And rather than being there, and th this, this woman was a, a Christian all of her life, and I know she loved the Lord, and, and uh, uh, every time the church door was open, she was there. And, and not only that, but just, just uh, she was a Christian. She was a Christian. But she could never get a hold of the reality of Christ in you. She'd never get a hold of that. She would embrace it, but never really get a hold of it. But my point is, I was there when she died at her bedside. And, her gra and she, she was afraid that she hadn't done enough to make heaven. And are dying. Yeah, not, not laying there being able to. Christ is my life. Yeah, the certainty of it. And over the years, I've talked to more Christians than I could even number who, in one way or another, had that same fear, that same guilt. We're not talking about going out here and sinning we're not talking about going out here and living in the world get real we're talking about christians who still have this fear and they can't come to the end of it because they're looking for the end in themselves mm -hmm. in themselves and when i the other day looked at that verse that we've been talking about in in hebrews in relation to what is said here to Noah, I thought, my God, because it is true. When I see Christ, and I mean see, I don't mean, I mean see him inwardly. When he appears, it's the appearing that we're interested in. Throughout the scripture, it's the appearing. God revealing his son, his son appearing in glory. His son appearing as who he is. When I see him, I see the end of me. 
I see my end. I see my end in the flesh. I see my end with regard to righteousness. I see him. And that is the greatest seeing that the soul will ever have. Absolutely. The seeing of him. And that's the reason that soul is born again. Absolutely. For that. And and like you said, it's such a sad and I you know, I lived for many years in that same vein of and it's all a symptom it's all a symptom a sad symptom of not seeing the end of all flesh because as you said the symptom of not seeing the end of all flesh that is in the sight of God and that's what happens when he reveals Christ is you're still looking at flesh in one way shape or form or another we don't God beholds his son as the end of all flesh, and we're here trying to get him to look at ours and assess ours to see if it measures up yeah. <laughs> to his standard. And the fact is, it's not found in his sight. And that's the thing that man doesn't want to realize. A man with a spiritual ambition or some kind of divine ambition doesn't want to, doesn't want to hear that God does not look at you or your flesh or your activities or your, he doesn't assess you to find his satisfaction or the conclusive object of his intent. He has the end in his view and it's his son. Yes. And the beautiful part is he has fully bestowed that to the soul. Amen. And, and as I said a while ago, and we've already said again, but I repeat right here, it, and, and the whole working of the Spirit of God is to show us exactly. that end. But you see, we get the, we, see, I've said this before. We, we, this is the first time we've said it. But I've said that, and, and people say, well, you know, that's just an excuse for you living the way you want to. And, and I'd, I'd, rather t I'd rather somebody just hit me in the face with a big shovel than to say that to me because you cannot see Christ and have that attitude. I mean, it's an attitude buster. It's more than that. You, you look in the scripture at those who have seen just an outward vision of that, a vision of it, Isaiah's vision Ezekiel's vision, Daniel's vision, on and on and on. And these men are up on their face. They're not claiming their rights. They're not claiming their life. Now I can do this. Now I can do that. No, no, no. That's not what we're saying. But more than that, that's not what happens. When he appears and you see the end of all things. You see, as I, I'll say it again, the end of you. And you see it in the person of Christ. And you see the one that is the end of you, that, as Paul did. You see the one that is the end of all that God desires, and he is your life. And the whole point we're trying to make is from that point on, we began to be drawn into God's view. Of salvation, God's view of His Son, God's view of the end. It virtually transforms our soul. 
Because no matter what you want to try to tell me, if you have not seen Christ in that inward, awesome, God-revealed, Father-revealed way, then you have seen only yourself and you're trying to apply these things to yourself in a way that you can become spiritually accepted of God. And that is an impossibility. It's an impossibility because Christ is the end that is come. Absolutely. It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Paul calls people like that he says they're intruding into the things they are seeing. I believe that. I they're believe intruders. that's exactly what he's talking about. And it's people that seize a testimony, just like we look at the words or whatever, and they try to apply that to their flesh and embody or evidence the intention of that testimony. Or like we do, take the word righteous or holy, and we apply it to our flesh, and we try to evidence that intention. And he's the end of it. He was the end of it when it was written because he was the basis of it ever being written. Paul calls it an intrusion. You're intruding into that because you don't belong there. He's the end of it, not you. Not I, but Christ covers not I good, not I bad, not I period. I mean, yeah, it does. it's not just not the old bad me. That's, you know, God had to deal with. No, it's, it's that I that I may even have the inkling that is good and acceptable and with a little bit of help can give God what he's after. No, that doesn't, that doesn't remain here. That doesn't exist in this. Uh, none of it. It's like, and I've been looking at it lately, Paul saying circumcision, uncircumcision, none of it avails. Does it matter? Why? Because neither one of those will bring the end. None of that. None of it. No. It's the end is something above all of that. The end is something greater than, than that. And that's the whole point. I mean, you can we can focus on those things that we think well. It's kind of like the knowledge of good and evil, and the things that we try to apply to ourselves to embolden and build ourselves up or whatever, and make ourselves spiritual as we can. And the whole time we've missed the end of it. Yeah. We've I mean, missed the we, end of it. And that's a shame because the verse that just comes out and hits me in the face is, he came to his own and his own received him not. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, we're his own. Mm -hmm. We're his own. And that fits so many believers. Yeah. And so many uh, ideas and of theology. Uh, it, it fits that. Uh, but when, where, if it's not Christ that your whole heart is turned to see, but rather if you are focused on being like him by either doing or by abstaining from doing, by either extracting yourself out of what so-called the world, when's that going to be good enough? Where, where's the end of that? And here's the fearful thing. There is a movement going on. It has been for some time. Not only in this country, but we hear from, we hear, we hear from different ones. Uh, we heard from a precious brother in Uganda, and I thought, oh, my God, it's, it's there too. It's like a plague. And I'll tell you where they take that they actually become God. In the last paragraph 
of a woman's book that is honored among that theology, that perversion. She writes, if your experience with God finds you just in the holy place, then it is still you and God. But if you have come to the holy of holies, then it is you as God. I've got the book. I've got the book. That's the end of the book. Is that where it's going? I mean, you say, oh, well, I wouldn't do that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But if you don't have Christ in view as the end, there's nobody else to have except you. He is the end. My Lord, there is the cross. There is the end of sin. There is the end of righteousness. That is the doing away with the one, the culmination and consummation of the other. Let me, let me read these definitions to you. Uh, they come from vines. And there's uh, the, the word that is used in the, in the Hebrew, it's a, it's a word that is spelled, it's either G, G, like in girl, G, E, T, S, or in some cases it's a double E, uh, which is not all that important, but that's, that, that's the word. And uh, a, a, a conjugate of this word is found every time the N, one of the meanings of of this word and it it means firstly and I don't know whether it's that's the order of or not but the first thing will it means it means and it denotes the end of a person or death the end of a person death uh, and 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 vines actually uses uh, the verse that I'm using the end of all flesh has come before me and that really thrilled me because I thought, my God, the death of flesh stands in the presence of God as the Son, yeah. as the Son. When I see Him, it's the death of me. <laughs> I mean, come on, blessed be the Lamb of God, man. Yeah. And the second meaning in the use of that word means uh, the end, it means end as the state of being annihilated uh, and one of the verses there is that he setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection well yes that's what the light of life does light annihilates darkness mm -hmm. true knowledge the knowledge which is the truth revealed, which is Christ, annihilates ignorance. Mm -hmm. But where truth is not seen, ignorance does abound. Oh, yeah. Thirdly, and related to its previous meanings, uh, it means it is it takes on the connotation of the farthest extremity of something, the farthest extremity of something, such as the end of a given period of time, uh, at the end of years, or in Hebrews uh, 1, at the end of those days taking something to its farthest extremity and bringing it to its end. My point is, hon, every one of these definitions are only found perfectly in Christ. He, by being the fullness of time, 
takes time to its farthest end and annihilates it. Hmm. Let me ask you a question on that. Can that also, because I'm, I'm thinking of verses here, and I've said something recently too, but that can be applied to man as well. Yes. Because, you know, I, w- I was looking at of what you said earlier about this whole movement of trying to seeing ourselves and trying to separate ourselves, do this, don't do that, to try to make man what he's supposed to be. And this goes back to what we were talking about, but we see Jesus. That's the answer to the what is man question. Yeah. Um, Jesus himself, to, to eradicate all of those con- concepts, was the greatest, most perfect specimen of humanity it's ever been. And he had to die. Yeah. Yeah. That culmination of the greatest of humanity, bringing Adam to his highest zenith. That's what he did, absolutely. Like the lamb without blemish, spot, couldn't have any of that. Well, he did the same thing with humanity, brought him to its spotless, as spotless as it could ever have been, and had to kill it. And that's what he killed. He didn't kill a drug addict, Jesus. He killed the most perfect human specimen that existed. Why? Because it wasn't his end. That's absolutely true. He brought that to an end so that he could raise up the one who was his end. That's the two sides of that, yeah. the word. But, you know, that to me, I saw that when you were reading that definition because it just, it eliminates all of that uh, concept of, perfection of flesh in any way it does or that God assesses it to find that at all how ludicrous would it be if he killed the most perfect specimen of humanity (laughs) because it didn't measure up it was flesh it wasn't his son spirit and truth it was humanity and it shows you that's not his end not his intent amen The fourth one, again, uh, uh, relates to all of these. Well, it would. And I was reading this. He said, this relates to the previous meaning and this relates. And I thought, yeah, it would because Christ is the perfect of all of that. He's the meaning of all of that. And the fourth one is, uh, it is that the word will emphasize and use a designated goal. Uh, a consummation, which we've been talking about here, a designated goal, the consummation. Uh, And all of that, all of those definitions of this one word are fulfilled in Christ. But they're not fulfilled in anything else. Where do I come to the end of the world? Well, I got to get out of it all and live as a hermit (laughs) on a desert island, you're still in the world. The only way I can get out of the world is inwardly come to the end of it in Christ. Mm -hmm. And you can put me in the middle of downtown Manhattan or you could put me on a deserted island. It wouldn't make any difference. I've come to the end of the world in him. And it's the same with anything you want to apply that to. But there's, but don't try to find an end in itself or an end in you that relates to it. Something you can do or not do. No, it's who he is. You know, I I think about James, and I think a lot of people miss this, or they really, I mean, it just kind of flies by. The doer of the word over against the hearer of the word. Mm -hmm. The hearer of the word here is the one that gets up and tries to do it. He runs out. The doer of the word is the one who waits in that word until that which is perfect appears. 
to the end, folks. Until they see Christ. Now that's, to me, that's true doing. Yeah. Because in... When, when, when God talks about the doing of the law, that you shall do them, here's the law that you will do them. In the Hebrew, a lot of times the word means to observe, to see. And it doesn't have a doing context to it as much as it has a observing, seeing it, beholding it. Yeah. And that's it. That's the doing of the word. It's the observing of the word's full meaning and intent instead of trying to apply it to that which is not. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. But yeah. That is true. Well, we're going to stop here. And we just wanted to kind of throw this out. We talked about it today. And uh, if you have questions, you have comments, please communicate with us. Email, phone call, I don't care. We may have, in this session, stirred up more questions, certainly, than we have given answers. We haven't tried, really, to do either. But we've tried to bring a focus upon the true end of all things as he relates to our soul, to our salvation, to our life, to our union, with Christ. The end. And all of this is in the context of the one who says, I am the beginning and the ending. Now, see, we try to look at that as a straight line. It's not a straight line. It'd be better you draw your circle. Because what that says is, the beginning is the end, the end is the beginning. I am the beginning and the end. And that's what we've been talking about here. Our focus must be upon Christ concerning all things of our salvation. All things of our salvation. So let us hear from you. And above all, we covet your prayers that you would pray for us and pray with us in our search. It is the thing that we do. It is the thing that is, it is, it is the desire of our heart to do it and to minister to you, the body of Christ, that which we are finding in the reality of him. So may the Lord richly bless you, and we look forward to being with you again on one of our telecasts. Maybe it's uh, Wednesday night classes, Sunday. Maybe it's the daytime classes. They're all there uh, listed in the home page, which, which you can find there on your screen. Uh, but we desire to have that communication with you on a two-way basis, and so we ask you to let us hear from you. May the Lord bless. Amen.